Hello, um, everyone. So you're welcome to um, this, uh, this lecture. Here we are going to continue with classical probability. Um, and then we'll look at probability rules and uh, complementary events. So that will be, um, that will fall under classical probability. Okay. Um, so classical probability, uh, this is this is important so that you can distinguish between classical and um, you know empirical probability. Okay. So classical probability uses sample spaces to determine the numerical probabilities um, of some events. Okay. So you don't actually have to perform the experiments yourself um, to determine that probability. All right. So you get you get the sample spaces based on the information, and then from the sample spaces you compute the probabilities. So it is called because it's the first type, as I mentioned before, of probability to be studied formally by by mathematicians um, in the 17th and um, you know the uh, 18th centuries. Okay. So history has it that it's probably um, Girolamo. Right, Jerome Cardin, um, who used his talents in mathematics and probability theory um, to make a living as a gambler. Uh, he is thought to be the first person to formulate the definition of uh, classical probability. Okay, that's a bit of history. So we we'll look at classical probability, um, and it assumes that all outcomes in the sample space are equally likely to occur. So the concept of um, equally likeliness, right? Is what is another unique thing about classical probability, apart from the fact that you need to use the sample spaces. Every event is equally likely. When you are when a single die is ruled, each outcome has the same probability of occurring. Okay. All right. So since there are six outcomes, each has a probability of one out of six. So each outcome has the same probability. The same thing with drawing a card. If you draw a card, from an ordinary deck, since we have 52 cards, then probability of drawing any card is the same, one over 52, all right? So that is, that is you know, that is a unique thing about classical probability. So um, by definition, equally likely events are events that have the same probability of occurring, okay? And that usually falls under classical probability, okay? So how do you actually compute the probability of an event under classical probability? Well, um, if you can, if you can uh, get the number of outcomes of the event, the event is E, then you divide by the total number of outcomes in the sample space. So get the sample space, get the number of outcomes in the events, and then the ratio of these will give you their probability. Okay, so the probability is defined by the number of elements, if you like, in the events, and then the number of the in the sample space. Okay, um, so classical probability basically uses the sample space to give you the probabilities. Um, secondly, you can express probabilities as fractions. You can also ex express them as decimals or percentages. For example, if you ask what is the probability of getting the head when the point is tossed, uh, you can see it's one half, 0.5, 50%, uh, and so on. These are all um, ways of expressing the probability. Okay. Okay. So, example for a card drawn from an ordinary, ordinary deck, find the probability of getting a king. What is the probability of getting a king? All right. So you ask the question, how many kings do we have? So if you go back, what is the number of the outcomes? So that will be the number of kings. And what is the total number in the sample space? Well, we know we have 52 cards, all right? So you take the number of kings divided by the total number in the sample space, okay? So if 52 cards, there are four kings, four uh, spades, four hearts, four um, clubs, right? Um, and then what? There are four, as I showed previously. If you go back here, spades, clubs, 
diamond, and then hearts. All right. So each of them has a king. So there are four kings. All right. So if we go back, that is what gives us this. So four kings, the two cards. So take four over 32, one over 13. That gives you the probability of uh, drawing a king. If a family has three children, we've seen this already, find the probability that all the children are girls. Okay. So what is the probability of drawing this guy? G, G, G. Well, there's only one of these in the sample space. So you take one all over the total number of the sample space. So that's one over eight. Okay. Okay. Then example 15, a card is drawn from an ordinary deck. We want to find um, the probability of getting a jack, of getting the six of clubs, and of getting a three or a diamond. Okay. The first two are straightforward. C is a bit tricky, right? And then we'll later on come to this to look at exclusive and uh, mutually uh, exclusive and not mutually exclusive events, all right? But we'll take a stab at this and then later on we show how um, this falls into a general uh, pattern or scheme. Okay, so what is the probability of getting a jack? Okay, well, we know that we have 52 in the duck, in the deck, sorry. Um, how many jacks do we have? All right, that will help us to, to compute that. All right, we have four jacks uh, in the 52. And so the probability of uh, drawing a jack will just be the same for over 52 as we saw before on the 13. Then the second one is what is the probability of getting the six of clubs? How many six of clubs do we have? Okay, there's only one six of clubs. Okay, so the probability of getting a six of clubs is just one over the total. Um, number of uh, cards, which is two. Okay, now the third one is, uh, as I said, it's trickier. It says that what is the probability of getting a three or a diamond? Okay, well, um, for the threes, each of the seats have, has a three, all right? So there are four of them, or a diamond, but a diamond also has a three in it. Okay, so so the number of diamonds, so we need to get a number of threes, probability of getting the three plus the probability of getting a diamond. That will give us the all, right? But we have to remember that the diamond has a three as well. So we need to subtract one, that is the three, right, from the total number of diamonds that we have in order to compute uh, this one. Okay, so that is the only tricky part. So there are four trays, okay, each of the seats has a three, and there are 13 diamonds, but the three of the diamonds is counted, counted twice, okay, in this, in this listing. So there are 16, that is four, four trays plus the diamonds, they are 13, but the diamond has a three as well, so you have to subtract one to give us a 16, all right? So that will give us the probability of drawing a three or a diamond to be 16 over 52, which is four over 13. Okay. All right. So you can think about this a bit, a bit more. So uh, as I mentioned before, later on we'll look at um, addition rules for mutually exclusive or not mutually exclusive events, which will provide a general criteria that we can use to um, to solve problems like you can see, like in this time. Okay, we'll look at that later. Okay, so let's look at um, some rules of uh, probability, all right? We'll look at four basic rules, um, and this will help us in solving problems of probability. They are simple rules, all right? The probability of an event um, is a number, right? Either a fraction or decimal between um, zero and one, okay? So the probability of any event should be um, the a number that lies between zero and one, inclusive, okay? It can't be negative, the probability cannot be a negative, and it can't be a number that is greater than one, okay? If it is, then it's not a probability. So that is the number one rule we need to remember. 
Uh, secondly, um, if, a, if an event cannot occur, then the probability is set to be zero, all right? Okay, so when, this is when, when a single die is ruled, find the probability of getting a nine. Well, we only have one to six on the die, so you can not you can never get a nine on it, which means the probability of getting a nine is zero, okay? So that's what uh, the second rule says. If we know for sure that an event won't happen or cannot happen, then the probability is zero. Okay, probability rule number three, if an event is certain, if we know for certain that a probability will occur, then that probability is one, all right? Um, so a certain for um, an event that is certain, probability of that event is always one. For example, when a single die is ruled, what is the probability of getting a number that is less than seven? Well, when we roll a die, we'll always get a number between one and six. So there will always be less than seven. So we are certain that the number we're going to get will be less than seven. And so the probability of that will be one. Probably the number less than seven will be uh, equal to one. Okay, so that was that's uh, rule number three. Uh, rule number four, the final rule here is that if you sum all the probabilities um, of the outcomes in the sample space, you should get one. Okay, if you get a number less than or greater than one, then you have to question the probabilities. Okay, so if you rule um, a fair die, each outcome in the sample space has must have a probability of one over six, right? Okay, so if you add all these one over sixes for the six different outcomes, um, you should get one. Okay, so what is the probability of getting a one when you roll a die? Well, it is one over six. What is the probability of getting a two showing? It's one over six, and so on. If we add all these probabilities, one over six plus 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 one over six, we should get one, right? Or if you take one over six times six, and there are six of them, you should get one, all right? So if I give you probabilities um, of a sample space, of a certain experiment, and you add all of them up, you should get one. If not, uh, your probabilities are probably wrong. Okay, then let's finish with this uh, for classical probability. Let's look at complementary events. Um, the complement of an event is the set of outcomes in the sample space that are not included in the outcomes of the event itself, okay? So oftentimes, you know, you write a complement by, by taking the, uh, the event and putting a bar on it, right? So E bar here would be the complement of the event E, all right? So if you like, it's the opposite um, of, of the event. So what is the complement of, for example, rolling a die and getting a four? Well, the complement will be getting uh, any number on the die apart from the four. In other words, the complement or complementary event will be getting what? The one, the two, the three, five, and six, okay? Uh, what is the complement of selecting a letter of the alpha alphabet and getting a vowel? Well, that is getting a consonant plus Y, if Y is a consonant, right? So getting any other uh, alphabet apart from the vowel uh, and so on. So you get the idea, okay? Okay, so they are here, okay? And uh, you, can, you can take a look at them. So that is a complement um, of, of an event. There are some rules that govern complementary events the probability of the complementary event is one minus the probability of the event itself, okay? And so the probability of the event will also be one minus the probability of the complement, okay? In some instances of problems, it's easier to use this or that, okay? Instead of finding the probability of the event itself, it's easier to find the complement and subtract the probability of the complement and subtract it from one to get that. Okay, and of course, by math, if you add the probability of the event and the complement, you get one. 
Okay, so that's a rule for uh, complementary events. So let's look at this example. If the probability that a person lives in an industrial, industrialized country of the world is one over five, okay? Find the probability that a person does not live in an industrialized country. Okay. So that's a complementary event. Right? The complementary event is that a person does not live in an industrial country. So to find a probability, you just take one minus the probability that a person lives in an industrial country. Five. And so you get four or five. Okay. So that's straightforward. Okay. So that covers um that covers uh, classical probability. All right, so we're going to end here. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll do look at empirical probability. All right, look at frequency distributions and, uh, and other ones. And, and, that will, uh, and that will bring us to uh, 